Hi everybody and welcome to Bible Study at St. Paul. This is the video for Revelation 17 and I'm really happy you're here with me. Um, really happy because I was having some trouble with the recording and I've gotten everything worked out and I have some new programs I'm getting to play with. So that excites the computer guy in me. But all that is beside the point because you are here, I am here, to look at Revelation 17 and to look at the material for that and the study for that. So we're going to get into Revelation 17 and to introduce the chapter, what I want to get us into is um, we're transitioning into a new section of Revelation. So if this is your first video, it's actually not a bad video for you to jump in on because here John is transitioning into his final vision of the end of, of creation as we know it, of the present world. Um, and it go, this, this next several chapters are actually going to go through the end, chapter 17 through 22. They go through new creation and the finality of that. And it's really cool because it, does, it summarizes and it concludes everything else. So it's not a bad place to jump in, but if you do want to, especially after you watch this video, if it's helpful to you, and you want to go back and see the previous videos of Revelation, we do have a lot of those out. Um, I started doing these via video, I believe in Revelation 12, so we have 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and now 17. And then we also have 1 and 2, and, and later um, we'll continue to fill in that gap. I am going back and retroactively recording those studies. So... That is all the introduction um, of the general section that we're moving into. What we're moving into now in chapter 17 specifically is a vision of one of the devil's two, ser two main servants, I guess. And this, the one that chapter 17 focuses on is the prostitute. Or depending on what translation era your Bible is from, some, some translations say the harlot, some say the prostitute. What I'm going to try and call her throughout is the faithless one. And I'm going to explain why I'm going to do it that way, why I'm going to call her that as we go forward um, in, in the, within our analysis of the text, I guess. And the first couple chapters of this whole vision are, are judgment of the dragon's henchmen. So we see the start of that in 17 and we see a lot of that in 18 of, of the beast and the prostitute, and if you want to hear more about the beast, I'm going to touch on it a little bit and summarize a little bit, but a lot of that can be found in the video for chapter 13. So that is kind of the background of this passage as we're going to go through, but as we go through, we're going to step into the first six verses of Revelation 17, and I do encourage you, get your Bibles out and, and walk with me step by step through your Bible because it does make it a lot easier when I'm making references to various parts of the text if you can have it in front of you. I'm going to have the text in front of you as I'm reading it aloud, but as I'm dissecting it, I'm going to bring the video back to me because I do like to communicate with my hands and face and stuff like that. So, anyway, get your Bibles out. If that doesn't work, get your uh, nifty, handy-dandy cell phones out and follow along if you can. So what we're going to do is start, like I said, in Revelation 17, cha verse, chapter 17, verse 1 through 6. It says, Then one of the angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away into a wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and in ten horns. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. 
and that's where we're coming from. So what this section is getting at is, again, this prostitute, this faithless one that I mentioned earlier. And we start off with the one of the angels from chapters 15 and 16 where they're, they're holding the bowls of, of God's wrath. They're leading John forward. And what's really cool is we see these angels or we see angels throughout being mediators and messengers for God and kind of holding John's hand as they walk him through everything that he's being shown. Which I think is, is really cool that they're... God is sending messengers specifically to John, specifically to us, to communicate to us, to explain to us, to, to help us understand everything that's going on and everything that will go on. So that's what we start with. And then we see the appearance of the faithless one. Uh, first of all, she's riding on the scarlet beast from chapter 13. This is the first beast. Um and we're going to we're going to get to that connection in a second but she the prostitute the faithless one is actually connected to the second beast from chapter 13 the beast from the earth so it's interesting to see she the same entity transitions from a beast to a false prophet to a prostitute taking whatever form is most effective at the time for drawing God's people for drawing people away from faith in God. And just a recap on both of these beasts, the first beast are kind of these, these human tools of the devil. You have political and social and economic powers that draw people into idolatry, that draw people to worship the, that beast of, the, of politics and religion and society, etc., etc., but also of the devil drawing people away from God. So that's what we have on, on the first beast that is being ridden, and then the second beast that is now in the appearance of a prostitute are the spiritual and religious tools of the devil. The, the beast from the earth, because it comes from within, it's this these ways that churches and Christianity and religions and spirituality actually lead people away from God. The faith and in a lot of ways i think this beast is more dangerous so that's kind of the initial image we're getting here and then i want to address this language of of the prostitute which i am calling the faithless one and here's why it's because throughout the bible throughout history god uses the language of prostitution the language of the prostitute about people gone astray with idolatry faithless women faithless people i think is the best understanding because it really covers that aspect um of being astray uh, of being led out of the faith of being faithless when it comes to god because the language that he uses is is language like the the israelites are whoring themselves out to idols and that's the language he uses so i'm going to use the language of the faithless one because i think maybe that both I think is more understandable to us, but I think it also, it connects with us a little better because we may not be prostitutes, but we might be faithless. And I think, and hopefully we're, we're more willing to own and challenge that if necessary. And, and the last kind of piece of the prostitute language I want to bring in is that in, in a lot of ways, this means she is honored or coveted or attractive to the world, by the world, um, etc. Which may bring us a little bit of discomfort at first, but I think, to be blunt, there's this reality that you don't make it in the field, in the career of prostitution, if you are not attractive on some level to somebody. Um, so when we're using this language of the metaphor, there's something attractive about this faithlessness. And as we continue through how she's portrayed here, she's sitting on many waters. And you, you may say, like, what, what on earth is that referring to? Like, what is that getting at? And this is the reality. Well, first of all, if you go back to Jeremiah, this is how Babylon is addressed. And waters are connected to the people, the crowds, the nations, the languages, all of these things of the earth that are now serving the faithless one. And what this is talking about is how she influences so many people. 
so many peoples and crowds and nations and languages. So my question for you, and this is part of the discussion thread down below that <coughs> I, I really want to get at is um, how do you think false spirituality and religiosity influence so much of our world today? And, and I, I really, I want you in it to interact with this because I think this is more dangerous than maybe outside sources that impact and draw away from God. Because if you're in a church, if you're in Christianity, you th there's a tendency to think you're safe. And there aren't going to be things that are pulling you away from God, but I think they can exist within the church, within Christianity as well. So I think it's really important for us to reflect on that, to talk about that, to discuss that. So what I would encourage you to do is pause your video. In case you've never made a comment on a YouTube video before, pause the video. You can press the pause button down below, or you can just hit the space bar. And then you scroll down, and there should be a comment down there that says discussion thread. How do you think false spirituality and religiosity influence so much of our world today? You click the reply button, you type out your reply, and then you hit enter. And your reply will get posted. And I'm really interested to see what you guys think. And then you just scroll back up to the video and you press play. And that's hopefully where I'm going to give you a second to do that. And now we're going to come back. And we're going to continue to go through these first six verses. And, we, and John sees her. The spirit leads him into the wilderness and he sees the faithless one. And what's interesting is that this is a revelatory experience from God. The Spirit is the one leading John. The Spirit of God is the one leading John, which is it's, it's kind of cool that, that God is, is playing such a direct role in this revelation. And then we may ask, well, why is she in the wilderness? If she has so much power and influence, whatever, why isn't she in a palace some way? Well, if we're recalling correctly, this is the beast, this is the servant of Satan that comes from within the church. And if you look at earlier in Revelation, God's people are in the wilderness, are in the desert to, a, to be protected by God. So if she's imitating the church, that means she's going to be out in the wilderness, trying to look like the church, pretending that she is the true church. And... As we see, she's sitting on the beast, um, on a scarlet beast that's described in the same way the other beast, the first beast from chapter 13 is described. And the beast is serving the faithless one at this time, which their roles go back and forth on who is subservient to who. And it's full of blasphemous names is what we see. And we may say, well, wh what does that mean? Um, at the core, blasphemy is anything that dishonors the living God. So this beast is full of things and that are dishonoring the living God. And that's what we're seeing here. She's dressed in luxury and splendor. And there's a, there's a little bit of an extensive description there. All of that just to say, like, she looks attractive. The faithless one, these temptations for us to be away from Christ, they look good to us. Which is an excellent connection to my sermon this weekend. So tune in to St. Paul's live worship to catch that and to see if you can make those connections. Anyway, and she's holding this cup that is filled with abominations. It's, it symbolizes everything that's unclean in the world. And then she's given a name. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. So there's this reality that ancient Babylon destroyed the temple, destroyed that which was holy and carried God's people off. So this false religion, this false spirituality, this, this servant of the devil is destroying the temple, is destroying that which is holy, and taking God's people away from him. So that's the connection made there. And those are the first six verses. And with that, we, it concludes with this really weird thing. It says, John says, When I saw her, I marveled greatly. After it talks about the drunken stupor that she lives in, and that's because of a steady diet of, of God's people, martyrs and sacrificial witnesses, different reasons. So we, we finish seeing all this and she's frankly doing terrible things. And we ask, you know, why, why would John be in awe over this? Why would he be marveling at this? And I think there are a couple different reasons that that could be. I mean, first is 
there's an incredible amount of luxury that she's showing even in the wilderness. So he might be in awe just his human nature might be in awe at how much luxury and splendor is involved there. He might be marveling at the judgment that he's already been told is coming her way. Or he might be marveling at her actions, at the fact that she's drinking, she's she's drunk off the blood and suffering of the saints. And then again, he might just be marveling at how incomprehensible the scene is, how incredible the thing before him is. So that's kind of this weird note that these six verses stop on. And then we can continue into the next verses where the angel responds to that. And the angel responds by saying, uh, the angel said to, to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. The beast that you saw was and is not and is about to rise from the bottomless pit and go to destruction. And the dwellers on earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to see the beast because it was and is not and is to come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman is seated. They are also seven kings, five of whom who have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain only for a little while. As for the beast that was and is not, it is the eighth. But it belongs to the seven and it goes to destruction. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power. But they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. These are of one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And those with him are called and chosen and faithful. So, what I want to get at, I want to again break this down just like I have been. The angel steps in and explains the scene. She, the, the angel reaches in and touches John where he's at. And what's really cool here is that his amazement is treated as a legitimate question. It's God is willing to interact with us when we don't understand things. And then we see this beast that falls and rises and falls, etc., etc. And this is what's necessary to lead people away. And this is a connection to how, what we see of the beast in chapter 13, where the beast is wounded in one head but makes a miraculous recovery. And people are in awe of this. And I think there's this reality, too. There's a rise and fall of all these things that draw us away from God. And the fact that they rise again gives people a reason to awe and say, look at how resilient and look at, look at the fact that this thing is rising again. Certainly we should follow it. Um, but... That's not what we're called to. Because the source of all of this and where it's rising from and what it's falling back to ultimately is the abyss, is hell. Um, so that's kind of this, this explanation of the beast. And then there are the seven heads that are seven mountains on which the woman is seated, which would have made an immediate connection with John and his original audience because these are this is Rome. This is a description of Rome. Rome was a city seated on seven hills, and its poets and its artists and its leaders were proud of that. We, they were the city of seven hills, or of seven mountains. So John would have made that connection pretty quickly. Um, and then there are these seven kings that, that get talked about here. And throughout history, they've been connected with a just a multitude of different kings, of different historical kings. Uh early church fathers tried to make these connections and say, oh, it represented these Roman emperors and these leaders, and, and people since then have said, oh, it represents these. I'd hold off on that. And, and another, and I didn't even write them down because there's so many different ones, and I'm not a historian, so I, I really can't vet the veracity of any of them, especially because as we get to in a second, that might not be the best way to look at this. And then we see, the, there was one cool one that I thought that connected it to seven historical empires, uh, like Assyria and the Medes and Babylon and Persia and Macedonia and Greece and Rome. And they made these connections, but I think if we look at this with the same interpretive lens that we've looked at the rest of Re Revelation, um, the seven kings represent all earthly powers who use spiritual power and spiritual authority to 
to strengthen and to claim authority that they rule by. And there's a reality that Christianity, Christendom, has been this in the past. I mean, if you look at, at Constantine, one of the reasons that Christianity became so mainstream in the Roman Empire is because he used it to solidify his power. So there, there's this reality that the seven might be symbolic of, of this crossover of political authority that draws from spiritual authority. And I think there is a reality to that in even America today. It, it is much harder for someone to get elected if they are not, if they are not at least nominally Christian. And you'll see politicians make, frankly, out of context and bad references to scripture a lot and generic references to God that people get really excited about, um, but are really generic. I, I wouldn't say they're a real witness because it's it's more deism than it is Christianity. Um, but there is this reality of, of quote-unquote Christian political leadership. And my question for you, and this is a discussion below that I really want you to weigh in on, is what are some of the pros and cons of Christian political leadership? Because there are obviously some pros. For example, in, in, in America, there is the benefit of, of Christian political leadership, both now and historically, where I can publish this video without fear of repercussion, and we can freely worship. Um, but there are also, there are cons in that we make sacrifices, uh, kind of for, and what I mean by that is, there's this danger of now we, we conflate and we equate certain politics and certain politicians with our faith. And I think one of the most dangerous places this takes place is we say we're conservative Christians, we're conservative biblically, so we must be conservative politically. And we, we say that in order to be a Christian in conservative Christian circles, you have to be a Republican through and through, which is dangerous and dumb because the reality is that republicans and democrats both have both have platforms and aspects of their platform that do agree with the christian faith for example the democrats their their attitude toward um how we treat people who are poor and in need and unemployed and suffering is they they, they have an incredible drive to help them and I think that's what we as Christians are called to do. We're called to help the poor and the needy and the suffering. And, and on the Republican side, they, they have a desire to prevent, for example, abortion, which is something that as Christians we, we are against. So I there is this reality that poly, neither side of the political spectrum aligns with our faith perfectly. But because there's been so much blending of, of faith and politics, I think sometimes we get caught up so much in politics that we make it our, our source of faith. And that's just one kind of protracted soapbox con negative of Christian political leadership. So again, pause the video, go down, comment, reply to that discussion thread. Um, and I'll give you a second and then we'll go back. And as we come back, we're going to continue walking through this. And it talks about 10 kings who have not yet received royal power. And it goes through, these are kings who rule by temporary power alone and only through power. That they, they rule simply through power. There's nothing else driving their rule. These are all the powers that the devil leverages in his war against God's people. A anything and everything, these kings represent that. And this is the war against the church of Christ on earth, against God's faithful people on earth. But it's concluded with a promise that they will be conquered by the Lamb, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings. And there, this is victory in final conflict. Because after the Lamb wins his victory and, and is back on his final, on his throne, there is no more conflict. He has won the victory forever. Um, and what's really cool is that this is the same Christ that 
sustains and defends the church throughout history. If you think about all the things the church has suffered and struggled against and faced and all the world has faced since Christianity started, the only way that it could still be around is if God was protecting it. Any other institution would have fallen. Um, so there is a great joy even, even now in the promise of the Lamb and his victory for his people. So that's what we have in Revelation 7 through 14. And we're going to continue to the final few verses of this chapter. That is Revelation 17 verses 15 through 18. And here's where we start to see the judgment. Because it says, the angel said to me, the angel said to John, the waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. And those are our last few verses um, for this chapter. Um, and those oppressed by the faithless one, the kings and the rulers and the authorities and the people are going to turn on her. That's what we see here. And this is actually an introduction for a lengthy, detailed account of her fall in chapter 18, which you will have to wait till next week to see. Um, but the ruling powers that enabled her, the political and social powers that enabled her, the beast that she was riding, are now turning against her. So my, my question for you, and this is my final discussion thread for this, this episode, is how might this be reflected in American deism, in American Christianity. Because there's this reality that Christianity, especially I think kind of this false watered down feel good prosperity gospel kind of Christianity is enabled by society and by politics and by culture. And there's this reality that when it's when all of those things start to turn against that false christianity maybe it makes us a little uncomfortable and my question is is it maybe we're getting too comfortable with this so my question is, is how is this struggle how is this reality reflected in american christianity and that is below um and this treatment of the of the faithless one that we see is a similar treatment seen in the old testament Ezekiel uses prostitutes to represent a faithless Israel, and they receive a very similar treatment. And what's really interesting in all this is that God is using faithless people and idolaters, and the, it says God has put it into their hearts uh, to carry out his purpose and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. So God is using even the faithless people, even the idolaters, to carry out his will. And there's this reality that God can use anything and anyone to carry out his will. Which I think is a great reminder for us to start to conclude on in that all of this is part of God's plan. And it's all ultimately for the salvation of his people. So we can take comfort in that even when some of this stuff sounds harsh or scary. That it's all part of God's plan. Um, and what I want to finally close on is that all of this can, I think, be taken as a warning, especially all of all of this about false religion and Christianity that draws us away from God instead of closer to him. Um, so I think this is a warning even for and especially for Christians that we are called to stick to Jesus, to to found to put our foundation on Jesus, the, the founder and perfecter of our faith. Um, so with that, this has been the Bible study on for Revelation 17. I hope it was helpful for you. Uh, like I said, if this has been helpful and this is your first video, we are we have several videos from previous chapters and we are continuing to fill in. So we will have the entire book of Revelation here on video um, for you to follow. And at this point, I do want to conclude with 
one final discussion thread that's going to be below. And that is any remaining questions or comments or concerns you have, please post them below. I will check and I will respond to them because if you have questions, I want to answer them. I want to be there for you. I want to be a support for you and for your faith, even though we can't meet in person. So that is there for you. Some shameless plugs, maybe not shameless, no shameless plugs for the YouTube page in general. Um, below this video, there is a, a button that click that says subscribe. Click that button. Uh, subscribe to this page because what's really cool is we're putting out more and more content all the time, every week. And if you want to see that content, if you want to be made aware of that content and you click subscribe, you'll be made aware and it'll be put up in your, in your YouTube videos. As you open the app, it'll be there for you to see. Um, just some examples. Obviously you want to get notifications about live worship that's going on every weekend. We go live at nine o'clock and at 10 45. Um, I'm preaching this weekend, so I'd love for you to tune in and um, to walk with you in that way. Also, we have, we have devotions that come out on a regular basis. We have chapel services for kids every week. And Pastor Andrew actually right now might be recording a brand new Bible study series that he's going to be posting um, called, I believe he's calling it Foundations in Faith. So that's really exciting. Um, so I encourage you, subscribe to this channel and uh, tune in to all of that. Um, so with that, this has been Revelation 17. Brothers and sisters, as always, go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.